All right, let's get this started. I feel like if you're if you're past the two minute mark, this is like high school, you're officially tardy. <laughs> well, hi everybody and welcome to the webinar. I'm Jessica DeMassa, I'm the executive producer and host of WTF Health. What's the future of health? Um, I say I talk to the who's who of health tech and healthcare innovation, and you're gonna be meeting a few of them here in just a second um, as we talk about real world data and tokenization. Before we kick things off, I wanna give a big thank you um, to those of us who brought us here to have this conversation. So to the folks over there at LexisNexis Risk, Risk Solutions, thank you for hosting this conversation. And to our friends at the healthcare blog, thehealthcareblog.com, one of healthcare's oldest and best known blogs talking about the business of healthcare, health policy and innovation, um, published and edited by Matthew Holt. Thank you for your support promoting the webinar and also for producing it for us here today. Um, without further ado, I want to welcome our panelists who you've all been looking at as you've been coming into this virtual space. So let's dive into doing this round of intros. All right, up first, I'd like to introduce you all to Matt Veach. He is a a real World Data, RWD, consultant, and he's the founder and manager director of Revisite Consulting. Matt's got over 25 years of experience in biopharmaceutical product and medical device management. So Matt, good to have you here. Thanks, Jess. Great to be here. All right, up next, we have Camille Cook. Camille is the Senior Director for Healthcare Strategy at LexisNexis Risk Solutions. She has over 15 years of healthcare experience, specifically focusing on leveraging big data to help improve clinical care outcomes. Camille, good to have you here. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Excited to be here. Excited to have you. And the last, but certainly not least, we have to we have Dr. Chirag Pargi. He is a board certified radiologist with fellowship training in breast imaging, and he serves as the chief medical officer over there at Solus Mammography. And as part of his role, he's responsible for clinical quality at over 100 breast centers across the country. So, Dr. Pargi, good to have you here. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, excited for this discussion. I'm excited too. Before we kick off, I have a few housekeeping things for the audience that's out there. You are not off the hook in this webinar. You're going to be asked to participate. So there will be a number of poll questions that will pop up on your screen. So be sure to take a look at the poll questions, respond to them so that we can put our panelists in the hot seat and give them something real time to react to. Um, and then as you have questions of your own, please go ahead and submit them. You can put them in the Q&A box um, using the, the panel at the bottom of your screen there. If we don't get to your question during the webinar, somebody will reach out to you and I'll make sure that your inquiry receives a reply. Um, and then at the very end of the session, when everything closes out, there will be a survey. So if you could do us a favor and fill that out, let us know how we did. We'd really appreciate that too. If you have to leave early, a uh, recording of the webinar will be emailed to you so you can see whatever happens um, in the dramatic conclusion of this conversation. Um, and let's just kick it off then. I think that's it. Um, I um, want to kick this conversation off with Matt. So Matt, you know, it's funny because I feel like I've been covering health tech forever and it really hasn't been that long. But the entire time I've been covering this space, everybody's been always talking about the promise of big data and healthcare, big data, data lakes, this and that. What can we do when we pull all this data together? You know, the ultimate holy grail in healthcare, the, the single patient record with all of the information. And it seems like we might be closer to that than ever before. But why don't you just high level kick us off here and, and tell us, you know, what it is about why we're having this conversation about data here today and what's changing that we should really be excited about. Yeah, thanks, Jess. No, I'm, I'm super excited to, to dive into the topic. I'm a, a passionate consultant in the space and work with a variety of companies focused on data. You know, data in healthcare, it's, it's nothing new. Uh, we've been using data for decades. And in fact, I would actually assert several thousand years. Uh, you know, on that point, Hippocrates, perhaps the most famous and greatest physician of ancient Greece, heavily considered patient outcomes in his Corpus Hippocraticum, uh, which was a, a, a body of medical works, uh, about 70 medical works about uh, patient interactions and care. So really one could say that data has factored into medicine for a really long time. And I think what's changed, you know, if we look at more modern medicine, clinical research is often heralded as, as sort of foundational to evidence-based scientifically centered medicine. However, the total volume of data that's collected as part of a protocol-driven clinical trial is fairly modest uh, relative to the amount of data that comes out of clinical medicine that occurs globally every day. Sometimes that's called the exhaust of healthcare. 
and this exhaust or real world data or RWD uh, was for, for decades uh, trapped in paper files. It was accessible only through tedious manual curation. It wasn't very user friendly at all. And I've been in the research space long enough to, to know and remember you know, paper filled charts uh, that, that you have to look at each page and sort of, you know, it's, it's just very unwieldy, not user friendly at all. And if we think about electronic health records today, they're faster, they're efficient, but they're often isolated or siloed in different institutions, or even within the same institution, they're, they're isolated, uh, um, you know, and, and, and not accessible, they're fragmented. And that fragmentation occurs across all facets of the clinical record. It could be the clinical care, pharmacy, billing claims, laboratory, imaging, uh, you know, that, that really creates a situation with that fragmentation that obscures the complete picture of an individual or a patient population um, or a population across, looking across patients. So uh, what we're trying to do with the harmonization and the aggregation of data is to complete that, that picture, have a more complete picture and really understand the impact of a disease or a treatment on a patient population. And of course, we have to do this while we're mindful of patient privacy and data security. Those are absolutely critical. And you know, asserting here that uh, health insights and research, the broadest insights are going to come from broad integrated real world data. So fortunately, some of the cumbersome process of trying to match data uh, across hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of patients is made easier and much faster through tokenization of real world data. Tokenization has the potential to unlock a wealth of insights from multiple data sets without compromising patient privacy or data security, given the rigorous methodologies that are used in the tokenization process. But not all tokens are the same, of course, and I will turn to Camille here in just a moment after a couple of poll questions to overview the great work of LexisNexis Risk Solutions and, uh, uh, and the, the great work that they're involved in in tokenizing data. So a couple of questions for the audience. All right, let's see those results. All right, okay. So for gamification, uh, it's a form of encryption related to cryptocurrency. Um, and yes, it's related to data protection, a process of exchanging sensitive data with non-sensitive data. So very, very good. And uh, let's see, what is your level of knowledge when it comes to tokenization in healthcare? Well, nice spread. Absolutely. <laughs> Just what we were hoping for. There needed oh. to be like, I, I've heard of it. I've heard something about it, but yeah, I might, I think that's novice, right? That's where I'm at. <laughs> <laughs> that's perfect. That's exactly what we're hoping for, which is why uh, we'll try to avoid a lot of jargon and acronyms in our, our webinar today. I mean, we, we want this to be accessible to everyone, irrespective of their, their background. All right, Camille, get us smart on this. <laughs> <laughs> Take us from novice to expert. <laughs> hey, I liked the use of the word smart, right? Because because at LexisNexis, we do feel like, you know, the smart token is really the next generation of tokenization. So I'm also going to kind of segue us into just a poll conversation. Um, but I do want everyone just to take a really quick minute at that so that we can kind of gauge level of understanding, especially as it relates to um, data itself. So first question, do you currently have a tokenization strategy in place? Very interesting results. And I think that our conversation today will really segue us nicely into you know, helping kind of support and promote um, some of these strategies in place at your organizations. Okay, thanks for answering that question. Um, so I kind of want to start the conversation just differentiating oh. between two specified, I think, maybe terms that get confused often, right, in the healthcare space in particular. 
Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about de-identification and its relationship with tokenization, right? We all know that securing and safeguarding patient data is of the utmost importance when we're leveraging this for research and development intent, as well as leveraging this over a period of time for outcomes as well. Um, so de-identification really means kind of obfuscating, right? The word obfuscating <laughs> is really just blurring blurring and taking away, right? You're basically taking a piece of paper, throwing it in the trash that has my name, my date of birth on it, right? That's a method of de-identification. Um, as governed by HIPAA in the US in particular, there are two primary methods to de-identification. One includes safe harbor, the other expert determination. Safe harbor, as an example, is like taking a black Sharpie and once again, kind of going over someone's name and date of birth. Oh, we've never seen it, we don't know it we're not gonna look at it, right? We're looking at the context and components within maybe a singular encounter visit associated with a patient um, that may indicate or imply a potential outcome or readmission, right? We can, we can label this outcome as a potential readmission to a hospital system. De-identification within itself under Safe Harbor actually strips out 18 unique identifiers that are extremely important when it comes to context and evaluating social determinants of health, uh, social and community context, demographic information that is really, as we know, leveraging big data, very impactful for making informed decisions for precision, precision medicine. Tokenization has really brought us into the space where Liability, we kind of wash our hands of a little bit, right? As an organization, if we talk about healthcare organizations specifically having a third party leveraging our tokenization de-identification strategy, tokenization within itself is really that bringing together through a unique identifier um, co contextual information that imply and indicate well-being, overall health status, social and community context, social determinants of health, bring them together into a singular space, right? So back to Matt's point, we're breaking down a lot of these silos as we move into this world of tokenization. Um, and what's interesting is if we look at kind of our understanding of tokenization, and let's be real at this point, it's, it's fairly infant in the market in comparison to old traditional methods of de-identification, right? And I'm referring to that black Sharpie marker um, and referring to Matt's, Matt's uh, indication of paper charts, right? Um, when we look at an electronic health record system and EMR, right, they were built to store data. They weren't built to analyze data, right? So we've now entered this crazy space where we have data components all over the world that concatenate and create real world data, which leads to real world evidence that allows us to care for our patients better, um, create informed policy that improve care coordination, clinical interventions, um, and then also some additional policies that can be governed on, on a national or local scale. So with tokenization, legacy, we look at kind of when we bring all of these or merge all of these together, we have an electronic health record system out here. We have a cancer registry over here that we're trying to link, trying to merge. Is this John Doe, the same John Doe over here, right? And try to bring those together. Um, we tend to look at that as kind of probabilistic matching, right? We're making an inference, which is what we do all the time with data. Every day we're making inferences with data, right? But when it comes to linking an individual asset or an individual KPI or indicator to a singular patient to effectively longitudinally follow them over time, Next generation tokenization, which means referential linking, right? We have the ability to effectively match John Doe with their specified social determinants of health. We're also effectively able to match John Doe with um, their electronic health record from maybe a third party, right? We're bringing all three of those data components into a singular um, secure database that is allowing for this additional context that we don't get with electronic health record systems, right? We get self-report data for the most part. And if you're a clinician on this call, you know people lie, <laughs> right? <laughs> and not in a bad way, it's just they, they, they want to make themselves look like the most healthy individual that's entered your office for that day. We know that at this time, at this time and place, health happens 
outside of the healthcare ecosystem, right? Health is not an indicator of, I go to the hospital and here's all of the components that you need to evaluate. My overall health and well-being, the longitudinal access to how to improve my lifestyle, if it's healthy eating, if it's habits, if it's, am I in a place where I have access to my provider? Yes or no, right? And in those circumstances, being able to effectively link these and connect them allows us to provide better care for our individual patients or the populations in which we serve. Um, what's really great about tokenization is that it prioritizes securing and safeguarding of patient data, right? There's really, really strategic mechanisms that are statistically validated where we create that unique identifier and link all of those assets that I've described, like social determinants of health, like claims data, like mortality data, again, back to a longitudinal or prospective cohort that we would be anal uh, analyzing, and bringing that back into a, a secure key, right? When we look at healthcare and we look at HIPAA, everyone wants to know who has the key, who has the key to re-identify this individual. The beauty about next generation tokenization is that there are so many obstacles to link back where you can no longer re-identify an individual within that data asset, which allows for this in-tune context, right? The way that I like to think about it is if I'm looking at a chart versus an Excel sheet, right? And I have an aggregate version of 100,000 populace on a chart, and I can see overall demographics associated with that 100,000, right? If I look at an Excel sheet, I can break some of those down and say, wait a minute, there's an outlier here. Where is that component that we maybe didn't factor into our analysis or our equation on how we inform patient care, how we direct precision medicine, and how we move longitudinally through the continuum of care? Um, and so that's huge benefit with tokenization. And again, back to that, back to legacy tokens. Legacy tokenization is methodologically probabilistic, right? So we're assuming, we're making that inference. Next generation tokenization with effective linking to referential components um, has the accuracy where those outliers can number one be identified um, and then sub-segmented as appropriate given your research me mechanism or research question. And then you can also factor those in as, wow, we need, we actually need more data on this specified variable, right? Is it a rural population? If yes, what are the components associated that, with that rural population that we're looking at for a cancer cohort, for example? Um, and I think that that's really interesting that we're entering in this space because big data has been around for so long, right? But we're now figuring out how to better interpret that data and we're leveraging that context with the data as well. Camille, real quick, I wanna pop in here because I know we have those other poll questions standing by and I think this is a good segue because you've mentioned a couple of keywords that I know are in those questions. So yeah. good time to launch those real quick. Can we, can we do that? Perfect time to launch Perfect. that um, next poll question. So here's your engagement once again. Um, question is, what kind of data sources do you currently use and access in your organization? So this isn't a one-shot wonder. Please, please select all that apply for your specified organization. This is super interesting to me because this is where I always hear from, you know, whatever entrepreneurs I'm working on that are trying to get access to data. It's like the, the myriad data sources and how you pull it all in together. And I love seeing imaging on there because I always feel like that's been the one that's been one of the more tricky types of data to integrate into all the other types of data. Absolutely. Like, look at all that SDOH data. Nice. Wow. <laughs> Impressive. Yeah. No, this is great. And obviously, I mean, the last three indicators, imaging, genomics, and laboratory data, right? Think about how hard it is to get that information. As you just mentioned, imaging, on an image, you're going to have patient name, date of birth. And so what's really cool about tokenization and next-gen tokenization is that you can actually create, again, statistical methodologies to omit that information where you're truly making a correlation between an image and maybe notes fields within a patient electronic health record system or image and result interpretation. So I think that's really, really impactful. And, and again, it's very exciting that we're all entering in this space and, and leveraging big data for some real world evidence and real world assets that 
that are in turn going to improve overall population health and well being. Um, so we'll go ahead and close this out. Let's see, and I think I had one more poll question, but I am going to actually wait because I do want to go into some of the use cases associated right. So we talked about electronic health record data. We talked about imaging for a second, laboratory genomics. It's really important when we're discussing real world data to understand kind of why we leverage it, right? Why are we leveraging real world data? Well, the easy question is real world data turns into real world evidence, right? We've always, you know, as a former researcher looking back, my whole theory was evidence-based theory is the way evidence-based theory, looking at publications, making sure that it's derived off of appropriate statistics. Every publication you read has some massive limitations, right? And a lot of those tend to be associated with the data inputs or outputs that they could acquire, whether it was directly derived from an electronic health record system or additional components, right? That they maybe had to merge and match on your own as a researcher. Um, so what's really impactful right now about referential next generation tokenization is that you are not only getting your electronic health record data you're getting your social determinants of health you're getting your claims data directly linked to that individual and you're able to aggregate that and make true inferences related to um, inclusive research right there's a big push right now in life sciences not only for diversifying clinical trials, but ensuring that your research is truly inclusive and indicative of the population that not only you're targeting, but the population that you're gonna serve over a period of time longitudinally. Um, and that becomes a really big aspect in how we develop our cohorts for clinical trials, right? Are we serving the appropriate people, yes or no? If we're not, how do we capture them effectively and within compliance measures, right? We don't want to target market our patients because that's just not appropriate, right? We want to be able to look at population level and say, okay, are these areas, are these individuals that would number one fit our inclusion criteria? If they don't, okay, we now have a strategy to move forward with our discovery and preclinical phase of our clinical trial, right? 80% right now of clinical trials are halted because of uh, issues with recruitment and, and being able to exemplify or kind of expand upon their initial cohorts. Um, in addition, you know, health economics outcomes research, right? We're in this life of value-based healthcare, value-based contracting. And what do we leverage for value-based contracting? We leverage data. <laughs> we leverage lots of data in order to, number one, make an inference to enter into a contract with either a health system or a third party. And then we also leverage that data to actually validate that inference uh, longitudinally as well. You look like you had something to say, Jess. Was there? There's some good questions popping in in the Q&A. I want you to take a oh. look at real quick, Camille. Yeah. And um, yeah, just a little bit of clarification on, on something that you just said. And then I was just curious about launching that other poll question. So maybe while you're taking a look at the Q&A, do you feel like that's a good time to launch that last poll question? Um, yes, let's do the last poll question and then let's get into the nitty gritty. <laughs> Beautiful. Well done. We have people paying attention. We appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay, we can probably hide that now and let's look at some of the Q and A's. Okay. So it looks like we have a question, is blockchain NFT a viable solution to this fragmentation to avoid centralization, especially in a European landscape where accessibility is much more of a concern from a research sponsor perspective? I love this question and I will also start <laughs> and then probably segue some components to some of my colleagues as well. Um, blockchain and NFT could feasibly be a viable solution. The issue with blockchain is that you lose all of the potentially what we call quasi identifiers associated with that individual. So being able to link through blockchain um, is very difficult, right? So if you had one database here with social determinants of health and one database here with imaging data, 
you would not be able to effectively link them with 99% plus confidence that this imaging uh, data component is directly associated with a one-to-one -one correlation to this individual within your electronic health record system. So great question. I know European landscape, I'm, you know, we're all navigating how to globalize big data, especially in the realm of GDPR, um, which can be a little bit concerning. Um, and this kind of leads into this notion of pseudonymization versus anonymization, right? Where you're pseudon pseudonymizing, if you can say that 10 times fast, you're pseudonymizing <laughs> each of the components um, that could be deemed quasi-identifiers. So when you're pseudonymizing those, again, you're taking away aspects of context. GDPR requires full, true anonymization, right? That anonymization does not allow you to link those effective quasi-identifiers or categorize them appropriately. And, and if anyone else wants to pop in, please do. Yeah, within, within external data sets, that, that's a very fair point. Um, uh, within though, but I, I'd like to kind of just put some color on this within, if you look intra healthcare system, the amount of data, it's the, there's an endless sea or an endless ocean of data and blockchain has utility there of, of allowing for quicker conclusions. And the, the way I see this playing out two, three years from now, five years from now, I don't know when the time horizon is, because we will be studying our own internal healthcare data sets. We'll be in studying our own health systems better. And in that utility, there, there may be a, a pretty strong application for blockchain. And just to, to add to that, I think, you know, if you look at blockchain and nifties as other tools in the toolbox, they have tremendous value and utility, but more from an organization perspective of the data, it's kind of echoing what Shirag was alluding to, it's the ability to have a faster recall of data within a health system or within an organization, but it's a different use case when you're talking about the linkage of, of data, the matching and linking process requires something different, which is where the referential token is, is so incredibly valuable. Yeah, great, thank you. And I see another question in from Scott. Scott, this is a great question. Um, he says, curious what is considered infant with tokenizations, technology, at least deterministic hashing has been around for many years and has been widely adopted. Absolutely true, right? So deterministic hashing has absolutely been around. A lot of us tend to leverage that for the majority of our internal processes, right? So if we're leveraging an electronic health record system, we want to export that data for publication, for example, we will leverage that deterministic hashing and possibly bring in one or two data sources. But again, it becomes that probabilistic matching where we're uh, maybe 65 to 72 percent sure on average that we have a true linkage between an outside data source and our internal data source. The goal with referential tokenization and what LexisNexis Gravitas provides is not just the hashing of the unique identifier. There are additional components that we're layering in additional context to that hashing notion. So we're being able to create a one-to-one -one correlation with a patient and their individualized assets, tokenizing them, de-identifying them for broader distribution. And just to, to chime in, I, I, I think as a, a real world data researcher and working with data scientists every day, uh, I think we're incredibly frustrated that we are in the infancy of using tokenization in the healthcare arena because there's so much potential uh, but, you know, it is a fair point. Tokenization has been used in the financial services industry for decades. So there's nothing new. I think it's the use cases where we're really talking about the infancy and being a fairly nasty in a way uh, of approaching in, 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 in such a, a novel way of approaching different uh, research use cases. So um, tremendous potential. We want to be out of the infancy as soon as possible, for sure. It's reasonable to, to assume healthcare systems are about 40 years behind the financial industry when it comes to embracing uh, technological changes. So I feel like that's it's about right. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree with that. Um, we do have someone who asked a question about uh, tokenization on the individual or population level. And I think that's really a beautiful question, right? I, I tend to talk about this often where 
you can leverage an individual token, right, for an individual patient or line item patient within your data sheet, for example, and follow them longitudinally through their continuum of care. So when we're talking about tokenization, realistically, we're talking about it at an individual level in addition to a population level. So if you have greater and more resolute insights on an individual that are tokenized, you can actually create a more contextual and whole person, kind of the way we look at whole person care. You're creating kind of this vision bubble around an individual to say, these are some of the components that impact their overall health and well-being, whether it's behavioral, social, or community context, et cetera. When you look at that on a population level, this is where we're able to omit some of those outliers, right? We look at the proportion of those individuals within that larger aggregate population where we can say, this is an outlier for only a subset of the population we're targeting. Right now for our research, this doesn't matter, but we're going to put this in our back pocket because if this comes up as a limitation over and over again, we're going to now reassess that variable that we have context to may or may not use right now, but we have context to that that allows for on an individual level to look at the continuum of care and then on a population level, how to make informed decisions kind of for the greater good, generalizability for clinical trials, et cetera. So I hope that that answered your question. And I think just to chime in a little bit around the permission, you know, that would probably require a, a, a deeper dive conversation uh, around HIPAA and, and uh, uh, data use and data use rights. But suffice it to say, we're talking about predominantly de-identified data. And uh, not to say that tokens don't have a place in working with identifiable data, they do because of the utility and value of matching and linking that's afforded through the token. But uh, from a, a de-identified data perspective, that's the real value of being able to match and link across disparate data sets, possibly across different health systems, different types of data as we've talked about. And so it really doesn't tie back to an individual uh, you know, consent, it's not identifiable in any way, it's certified to be identified. And we can, again, talk about some of those finer points and some of that might be a little out of scope for this conversation, but suffice it to say, you know, privacy is a, a key consideration and one of the main reasons to be using a referential token. Well said, Matt. Right, we're going to keep encouraging you guys to submit your questions. These are awesome questions. So we'll come back to this at the end. And I think, Camille, I want to, anything else from you to kind of wrap up the conversation from, from your perspective? Or can we can we bring in um, Chirag into this conversation? Because I know he's got some slides he's eager to share with us. But a couple <laughs> poll questions first. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think my use cases kind of demonstrated a really nice segue where we talk about longitudinal studies, clinical research, and outcomes associated with individuals. So Shirag, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And I think we're going to begin with the poll question that uh, to me seems a little bit silly because we already know the next March Madness winner. It's going to be my Missouri Tigers. So <laughs> I, I think that this is just kind of a, a silly question. I apologize for that. But um, think on this one. I'm warning you guys. Think. Yeah, it's a hard one. <laughs> And so I'm going to focus on some use cases that I could not be more excited about. Uh, I, I think that we need this today. We needed this yesterday, years ago, um, at the patient level. And I hope to uh, to to convince you based on uh, some some pretty um, interesting cases. So the majority of people think it's a breast cancer, which is, which is an application. Um, some people say uh, say both, and uh, one one person thinks it'll project next March Madness. March Madness. Um, <laughs> fantastic. Fantastic. I, I'm excited with that. Um, I'm going to share some slides, so if you'll bear with me. Uh, so I, I'm, I could talk about any one of these singular topics for hours, so I'll spare you and um, just try to keep it as high level as I can. Breast cancer, we know, is a very common disease, um, the most common cancer that affects women in, in this country, one out of eight lifetime risk of getting breast cancer, right? And what I tell patients are, it, it's not a dark thing to talk about. It's actually very very promising, very good news in this day and age when it's caught early. So this graph here, which is taken from the AJCC, is it shows what so the x-axis is zero to four in terms of the stage of cancer. 
So zero would be a really tiny cancer caught early. As it gets bigger, stage one, bigger, stage two, two and a half centimeters or greater, or it spreads to lymph nodes, you start getting into stage three and four. Naturally, it makes sense to us. As breast cancer gets bigger, the 10-year survival would drop. Now, ideally, we want to catch every cancer at stage zero. We want to catch it near stage zero so that there's near 100% survival, right? And when we catch it this early, we use the word cure. The, the results are in the 95 plus percent in terms of 10-year mortality, 20-year mortality. It's pretty exciting. And that is where I see, and I'm going to signpost, a massive opportunity for real-world evidence, right? And so what is the current state? We have um, one of our esteemed radiologists that is does fantastic work. We have amazing breast imagers looking at mammograms very carefully and finding tiny, tiny spots of breast cancer, right? They find them if women are consistent about their yearly mammograms, we find them less than the size of my knuckle, which is pretty impressive. It is in that zero to one state. Too often though, we're not catching it that way. We're still catching it in stage two, stage three, where we have less of an impact, right? So, but even, even compliance aside in terms of how good of a job we do in the mammogram. Right now, we're left to our ability to diagnose abnormalities that pop out to us. It's a visual diagnosis. And let's be frank, there is too much subjectivity. It's based on our own recognition of disease, our own expertise, expertise. and what we know to be normal and abnormal. And we do a great job. So I don't want to throw any stones. That's not what I'm suggesting. Our, our, we've, we've gotten ahead of, of early diagnosis and we Women are living longer and longer after being diagnosed with breast cancer, but can we do it better? That's the question I want to ask you. And I, I ask you by this case, right? So this is a mammogram and I'm just going to give you a quick orientation. The image on the left is kind of a, is a craniocaudid or colloquially called a pan, pancake view. If you're looking down at the breast, um, the front right here is the nipple. This is the chest wall. This is the outer side of the breast. This is the inner start near the uh, sternum of the left breast. This is the side view. This is the head. This is the foot, this is the nipple, this is the chest. It's as if you're looking from the side. So it's almost two 90 degree views. This is the traditional view of a mammogram. So I have to be honest. I think I'm a legend in my mind. I think I'm one of the best breast imagers out there. We're all very proud, right? There is a lot of, there's a chip on our shoulder. It helps us do good work, right? I think I do amazing work. I was about to read this case as normal. I, I was about to, I was about to say, hey, come back in a year. I don't see anything. Luckily, we had just gotten brand new state of the art um, computer detection software that helps us look at even on 3D images, looks for tiny, fine abnormalities. So I was about to read it as normal and sign it off. And then I saw, wait a minute, it flagged my eye right here, it flagged some other things, and it put a percentage on here. Camille was talking about probab probabilistic assessments. This is actually a probabilistic assessment. It said, hey, there's an 86% feature set match between the features, the imaging features of this and a, a known cancer library set. So I looked at that a little bit carefully. And at first I'm like, ah, fine, I'll call it back. And I'm using four letter words to describe the software. And then we have the patient come back. It turns out to be a small, a four millimeter invasive ductal cancer. That was a, that's an aggressive cancer that we caught tiny, maybe half the size of my knuckle. Now, if you look at, you can ask the question, does it matter? Okay, we could have caught it bigger. But if you think of that survivability curve for this patient, because we were able to match every single pixel of this mammogram to a referenced cancer set of prior cancers, we were able to catch something smaller. And there are many, many cases like this. And this is the direction mammography is going. And, and it's exciting. And so I, I, I have to pause and ask the question, what else could we be using our past knowledge of disease for? And I'm going to keep asking that question. You, you, you think of the way autoimmune conditions are very sometimes very difficult to diagnose. Certain neurological conditions, very difficult to diagnose. Certain cancers, breast cancer, we catch it early. There are certain cancers that are much harder to diagnose. Ovarian cancer, pancreatic cancer. Some of these conditions, we don't catch it till it's stage three or four, unfortunately. Where can we use our past data sets to find out patients that have a higher probabilistic chance that we need to scrutinize a little more carefully? This is yet another application. So this is a patient that came in 2019. She came in for her, her mammogram. This is, this is a mammogram. This is a, a recording device, a pacemaker kind of equivalent. Uh, and so she came in in 2019. Now, again, I, as much as I want to throw stones on somebody else that read a mammogram, I would read this as normal. It was read as normal. I don't see anything abnormal here. I have to be honest. In 2020, we knew life got a little bit complicated. Um, it was a COVID year. It was a pandemic year. 
this patient skipped her mammogram. A lot of women skip mammograms. Not too many women skip their, their annual mammograms that year. I'm going to avoid that dissertation and move forward. In 2021, she came back in. At this point, we had our software available and also an astute radiologist picked up this abnormality here. Turned out to also be an invasive cancer. Still pretty early, still pretty early on that survival curve. But my question is, could we have done anything more? And then what we're learning now is what we're, what we're starting to really get into is image-based risk of saying, hey, ma'am, what is your one-year risk of getting breast cancer? And I went back on this case because I was curious. In 2019, we didn't have the software. But if we ran this mammogram through, it would have been read as high. So we could have focused on this patient and said, ma'am, please don't skip a year. Whatever you do, I don't care if you don't file your taxes, don't skip a year. We could have really focused that knowledge to that patient and used that to guide her compliance. If we did that, we could have caught this early. So it's easy to think about all of these topics as you know, quixotic theoretical ideas. These aren't ideas. We need to be comparing every single mammogram and dare I say it, every single imaging study to every single prior to make sure we make better decisions today. This needs to come faster to day-to-day -day medical imaging and to day-to-day -day healthcare. And I could not feel stronger about that. Now, instead of continuing on a dissertation on that topic, I'm gonna to ask a different question. What else can we understand about our, our patients from the mammogram? And for those of you that got that answered only breast cancer, you, I'm gonna challenge you on this, right? So breast arterial calcification. So arteries of the breast are like arteries of the legs, arteries elsewhere in that they can develop spots of calcium. Now, is this associated with breast cancer? Not really. And it's something we traditionally have to overlook. We said, eh, that's just a distracting finding. It's not breast cancer, let's not think about it. But what we're learning is that, hey, there may be a correlation, a pretty strong correlation between maybe heart disease or even non-heart disease cardiovascular mortality. And there's been studies that have already come out that, hey, this matters. This is found a lot more in patients that have kidney disease, that have diabetes, and that, that develop heart disease through those channels. So there's a lot more information on there. And we're studying this at Solus with one of our partners to say, hey, you know, if a patient comes into one of our breast centers, should we only be screening for breast cancer? Or is there more information that can be extracted? And that's kind of a larger question. How much information are we just throwing away at every encounter? A patient comes in, sure, we do a great job at screening for breast cancer currently, could we do a better job? Could we find breast cancer before it shows up as, as, as a spot on a mammogram when it's just a number? Could we go even before stage zero? At the same time, are there other disease patterns we can identify on the mammogram that could screen women for heart disease? The reality is that women are under screen for heart disease. Women are, their symptoms are different. And 80% of this is directly from the American Heart Association. I don't make graphics. I couldn't make anything this pretty. This is directly from them. We could be screening for additional disease, and we're not. We could do so much more, and in order for us to do this, we have to rely on past data. We have to use our past to inform our current decision making. It kills me, and so this is a call to action. We have to leverage our understanding of cancers of every disease type to inform, inform our current and future management of disease. I, I watch football, and I see what is the percentage of making that catch, but I still, we are not there in medicine where we don't understand the percentage of us making decisions on findings that are right in front of us. So we need to get there faster and better. And it requires us belly flopping in the pool of real world evidence. So I, I could not feel stronger about it because I see it every day and I see opportunities and I'm wondering what else am I missing? So on that note, I'm gonna turn it back over to Jessica to, to kind of field questions and to really um, explore this topic more. Sharon, I love your question. Go ahead, go ahead. I, no, I just, I wanted to kind of ask a question that I think is really important between kind of the linkage of this longitudinal study, uh, specifically for breast cancer and how that relates to tokenization. Um, one question I kind of have is, is we talk about creating risk, right, or inferring risk associated with patients that may or may uh, not need additional services, they may need more outreach, they may need more targeted therapy, for example. Um, how does tokenization itself kind of directly relate to that risk-based thinking, right? We're moving now from 
from probabilistic matching where we make inferences off of probability, right? But we're not making decisions off of probability. And, and sometimes we are. And if we are in the healthcare system, that's a huge risk for our patients, right? Yeah. I guess my short answer is tokenization at unprecedented accuracy. It, when, when you get accuracy, you make more intelligent decisions, right? Risk models exist. We have questionnaire-based risk models. So risk, tire acusic is a fantastic risk model that's been extolled. Its virtues have been extolled since the early 2000s, but it is much more accurate on European women than it is on every other race. And we talk about social determinants of health. That's a perfect example. These current risk models, that risk model that we use that I showed you, that's more Afri accurate in African-American women than Caucasian women. So it's when we have tokenization, we can link patients to their full record. When you can link patients to their full record, you can make more accurate conclusions for that singular patient and for other patients because you have a complete data set. And I, I could not um, be more of a champion of that idea. We and have just to data silos all over and we make decisions. Poor dinosaur time era decisions based on incomplete data sets. I'm sorry, Matt, I didn't mean to no, no, no. Uh, I, 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 I absolutely love it, uh, Chirag. I, I, I think it's, uh, it's tremendous. And, uh, you know, to, to really oversimplify, more data is not necessarily better, but more data with precision is very, very uh, impactful in, in medicine of today and medicine of tomorrow. And I think that the commitment of Solus to the democratization of data in a way that is mindful of privacy, in a way that is mindful of data protection uh, by tokenizing with the Gravitas token and LexisNexis. I, I think that that is, is going to really uh, have a dramatic impact in breast cancer research, uh, the ability to have tokenizable data with actual images, not just radiology reports, but actually being able to recall the uh, actual images themselves. Um, you know, tremendous impact in uh, breast cancer research, very specifically, and uh, looking at the the calcification data and, and looking at risk models for uh, cardiac care and, and mitigation of those things. I mean, the 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 tremendous potential. Um, it's it's so exciting to see. Yeah, I, yeah. I, can I add to that too, related to the social determinants of health. Right, we we look at social determinants of health as maybe capturing more context for populations that we already semi understand. I think sometimes we forget about social determinants of health um, for those that we may not be targeting, for those that we may not be supporting, that may not be accessing the healthcare ecosystem and have limitations associated with that, right? So I think this kind of really plays into how does SDOH fit into the world of tokenization, right? And, and to kind of segue into that, at LexisNexis and LexisNexis Gravitas in particular, you know, we're able to capture a good portion of the population that is underbanked or unbanked, right? Which, which when we look at other social determinants of health, we kind of, we, we look around and we say, okay, they've got a linkage to credit bureau data specifically. That's not gonna capture everything. Think about those vulnerable populations that are not accessing our healthcare ecosystem that we need to prioritize, right? And not only prioritize to get in for mammograms, for example, but prioritize related to their treatment. Are they gonna have access to a provider to follow up and adhere with the treatment that we then provide for them over a period of time? Do we know their income stability and their economic stability overall? Um, and so I think that's a really interesting concept to think about what data attributes are out there, right? And, and economic stability is obviously one, but there are a lot of social determinants of health that are really gonna impact the way in which we individually care for a patient and how we leverage that again for research and development um, to kind of broaden our scope and, and generalize a lot of our results um, and outcome studies associated with the, the larger population. Yeah. Greg, I want you to like, can you draw the line all the way through to that based on what Camille just said about that social determinants of health data? Like how can that ultimately impact like patient engagement initiatives and get more women who should be coming in to get their annual mammograms like into the door to do it? Sure, sure. I could speak volumes on this. So I'm, I'm just trying to be succinct is my challenge. Um, <clears throat> the We've We've become pretty obsessed with this at Solus Mammography. So we have a, a pretty robust compliance uh, mechanism that's heavily based in machine learning. And we've studied the women that we have a kind of, I don't want to use it aggressively, but 
um, enthusiastically champion to come back in that have been skipping mammograms. And what we found is mind bending. So if you take women that have missed a mammogram for at least four years and you really encourage to them to come back in, it, it, from a scientist standpoint, you should have, in theory, you should have the same percentages of cancer as any group of women that comes back in. But maybe the cancer is at the later stage, right? Maybe because they skip mammograms and get more advanced. What we're finding is actually that there's many more cancers in that. So the risk factors that cause women, I hope I'm explaining this right, the risk factors that would cause women to potentially skip mammograms, the same social determinants, risk factors, whatever words you want to use, actually translate to higher rates of breast cancer as well. So it's the, there, there's, there's so many wins that can happen in this space by getting women in the door and really understanding the factors that would keep women from getting in the door. So what we are focusing on at Solus is really identifying those women that have higher chances of being non-compliant for a variety of reasons. And yes, there are socioeconomic causes. There are non-socioeconomic causes of poor compliance, right? And so understanding all of those to, to better understand our role, that we can pat ourselves on the back when we catch a cancer on a mammogram there. What about the woman in our community that's not even coming in that has a late stage cancer, right? So it, it redefines our obligations, which is super exciting. I'm doing a last call for questions here, everybody out there. Got like less than five minutes left. But yeah, if you've got a question, we don't get to it. Um, somebody will contact you on the back end. All right, I want to ask uh, Matt real quick. How I mean, we saw at the beginning with some of the polling, people are in various stages here of, of deploying, implementing a tokenization strategy. So what is your best advice for how they should you know, evaluate their current or future tokenization efforts? Yeah, I, that's a great question. I think you really have to to go back to what do you want to accomplish? I know that sounds very elementary and basic, but but honestly, the use case is the driver of the data that you need and what you think you need and what you may really need, that fit for purpose of the data is something that's really important to delve into. And I think that uh, depending on, again, those use cases, the harmonization of electronic medical records uh, with imaging, with laboratory data, with pathology results, I mean, that triangulation of, of, of data just affords so many more insights than we've had accessible to us in the past. Camille, close this out for us. I mean, I don't know if you want to take one of the last questions from the Q&A, or I know we had we had talked about talking a little bit more about the referential data layer. So I feel like you're kind of a question answering ninja here and can maybe <laughs> do a little bit about it. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I see someone just uh, through the Q&A asked how many social determinants of health attributes does LexisNexis provide? Um, so we provide over 448 individual attributes. So those would be 448 attributes attached directly to an individual, right? Um, this create this is along the lines of economic stability, social and community context, access to transportation, education, quality of healthcare, et cetera. Um, so that kind of answers that question. And in addition to that, we actually um, have within our LexisNexis Gravitas network right now, we have claims data, mortality data, along with social determinants of health. So the goal is really to kind of create these really large blended data sets where we're bringing in not only our attributes, but from our network partners into a tokenization landscape, which has been extremely successful up to this point. Um, you know, we're working with Solus and, and as Shirag had mentioned, you know, leveraging that social determinants of health data. And he, he did mention not only social determinants of health data, but the claims data and mortality, especially when we're looking at longitudinal prospective studies following people over time. Um, those are really important attributes to, to append onto the referential token. And I do want to make the point, and I think Matt said this really nicely too, is when we look at precision for a token, we do not want probabilistic matching in a clinical space because we're making inferences consistently in the healthcare space right now. We really need to accelerate that next step of, of um, precision medicine, which all comes down to precision linking and one-to-one -one correlations of attributes associated with an individual while keeping in mind the security and safeguarding of their um, sensitive and potentially identifiable information. 
All right, well, let's leave this there. A big thanks to our audience who was incredibly engaged. Don't forget, guys, there's a survey at the end of this. And if you're interested in hearing about some more of these data assets that are available through LexisNexis or about tokenization in general, one of the survey questions is like, yes, please let someone reach out to me. So hit, hit a yes on that one for us. Um, and thank you. Don't forget, if you want to see this again, it will be emailed to you in its entirety. And a big round of applause, big thanks virtually to our panelists who joined us here today, Matt, Camille, Trog, thank you so much for this conversation. I mean, I feel like I've learned so much and it's like, there's still for me a lot to go, but I mean, the, the potential is really what I think is most important in understanding here is that all these data assets are out there. They do exist. The technology infrastructure for making them all work together is being put in place. And then Chirag, especially, thank you for just, you know, kind of really setting my sights towards the future about what could be possible, not, not only when it comes to, to breast cancer and women and heart disease, but also if you take that case study and just, you know, apply it to any other area of medicine, I think a truly, really inspiring conversation all around. So thank you all so much for, for that. Thank you. And uh, really appreciated your uh, your your uh, wonderful moderation, uh, Jess. Thank you so much. And great, great questions, great dialogue with the team and, uh, and just very enjoyable. So thanks to the audience. Yeah, thank you guys so much. We'll talk to you guys soon, hopefully. Uh, stay in touch with us. And uh, that's it. It's a wrap, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. -bye.